Well, I can't wait to meet our host. I hear this is only one of his beat parties. Stay positive, the love will come back to me. Stay positive, the love will come back to me. Stay positive, the love will come back to me. Stay positive, the love will come back to me. Hey, this is Harry Day. Welcome back to Two True to Lie. Usually I say welcome back to Two True to Lie with Harry Day. The challenge of this whole podcast and episode creation is trying to say too true to lie without screwing it up. Try it. it say it three times. I'm not going to try. I'll screw it up. Um, we are going to look at a very lighthearted, heavy caloried subject, the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I've got two sources. I'll be bouncing back and forth between the two. We're going to learn some really interesting things if you're into useless knowledge. So let's dive right into the PB&J. We're going to learn some history. We're going to learn... I've already said that. So, uh, I got to go to a different subject here. <laughs> I still haven't found it. This is not a great beginning. The peanut butter and jelly sandwich obviously is made of peanut butter and some sort of pr fruit preserve, jelly or jam, spread on one or two pieces of bread. Slices, if you will. It can be open-faced. That open-faced can be folded over. It can be two slices. This is what the info is telling me. A survey done 20 years ago states the average American will eat 1,500 peanut butter and jelly sandwiches before they graduate high school. And the number will climb more slowly from there. Uh, peanut butter or jelly sandwiches are also known as peanut butter sandwiches or jam sandwiches. Uh, the basic way to make it, obviously, is you get peanut butter, which you buy at the store, and you spread it on one piece of bread, and then you get your jelly or jam and spread it on the other piece of bread, and then you jam it together. I don't think we'll get too much into the making of jelly. It's like ma it's like making preserves. And I'll leave it at that. Their combination creates a watery adherent that can help them stick together with the bread. Sometimes it makes it soggy depending on your jelly. It says here, especially if the sandwich is prepared ahead of time and put into a bag or lunch box and left to be eaten later in the day. The fat and the peanut butter blocks the moisture from, from the preserves to keep it from entering the sliced bread. Thus, it will not become soggy. Isn't that interesting? There's a scientific method. Um, I should have been more prepared for this, but that's all right. Uh, there is a technique utilized by manufacturers of food that do a sealed crustless sandwich called Uncrustables. They're frozen. My kids eat them. Uh, I had to wait until 1 a.m. to do this because my son was awake with me and he finally fell asleep. And the dog just came in here to drink water. Y'all missed that because I didn't push the button until it left the room. He left the room. And so now I'm already out the gate struggling on this <laughs> episode. They're not all smooth like uh, smooth peanut butter. <laughs> Let's see. There are many variations of the sandwich. Sometimes there's peanut butter and honey or peanut butter and sliced fruit instead of the jelly component. There's the 
ever fascinating and favorite to me, peanut butter and banana sandwich. That I prefer that myself. There is a marshmallow fluff substituted instead of the jelly. To add extra flavor, to me it would be adding extra nastiness because I'm not into it. The sandwich is called a fluffer nutter. I can think of some uh, other definitions for fluffer nutter. But this is a family friendly show today. If you see the explicit episode, it is not family friendly. I've only got about three of those. Now, almond butter is a substitute for peanut butter. And uh, sometimes those are known as nutter butters. There are seed butters, like sunflower seed butter. There's cream cheese substituted for peanut butter. And there's Nutella, which I've seen kids finish a jar with their finger and have it all over their face. And not just one kid. I've seen my kids both do it. I've seen other kids do it. Um, Peanut butter was derived and originally paired. What they did was they took the peanuts and they crushed it into a spreadable thing. That was before they started putting additives into it. It was uh, paired with more savory foods before jelly came along or jelly was used uh, with pimento, with pimento cheese, with celery, with watercress on saltines and or toasted crackers. It was an article in Good Housekeeping in 1896 that published a recipe that, quote, urged homemakers to use a meat grinder to make peanut butter and spread it on bread. The following month, another culinary magazine, Table Talk, published a peanut butter sandwich, unquote, recipe. Finally, an early recipe for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich appeared in the Boston Cooking School Magazine in 1901. This recipe called for three very thin layers of bread and two layers of filling, one of peanut paste, whatever brand you prefer, so I guess there was more than one, and the other of a currant, C-U-R-R-A-N-T, or crab apple jelly for the other layer. This part I don't get. And they called it as, quote, so far as I know original, unquote. I don't know what that means unless that was the original peanut butter and jelly sandwich recipe. It'd have to be that because both uh, ingredients already existed. In the early 1900s, the sandwich was adopted down through class structures as the availability and price of peanut butter dropped. Meaning, and I'll have to go to the other source here, bop, bop, bop. Peanut butter and jelly sandwich was an exclusive food and its popularity among the masses had yet to come. It was for the wealthy people or, or, you know, people that knew what they were doing and could make peanut butter. Because preserves are already being made. Um, It's the peanut butter had an early incarnation in the form of, quote, peanut paste. And by most accounts, it was a tough sell because it was basically a dry, hand-grounded paste made from peanuts. Maybe they add a little salt. Maybe they add a little sugar. They didn't add xanthan gum. I doubt that existed. It may have. I don't know. In 1903, the invention of the peanut grinder came about. And then later, a churning process that made the peanut paste become a little more fluid. 
This was known as hydrogenation. Reader's Digest states, quote, a chemical process that kept peanut butter from separating. Oh, how scientific is that? It enabled it to last longer, which was a game changer for peanut butter's popularity. And kids loved it. They flippin' loved it. Yep, time for some tea. All right. A man named Joseph Rosefield came up with Peter Pan peanut butter, introduced it in 1928. It was the first dominant national peanut butter and a big seller. And the partial hydrogenation process was patented by Joseph Rosenfeld. He was from Kentucky, and he was kind of an oddball, they say. He fell out with all of his associates and the company he was working in or with or owned when they wanted to reduce his licensing fee. So he went out on his own. He left Peter Pan and started Skippy. And that's when Skippy was born. How about that? He was inventive. He was obsessive. He was very obsessive with quality control. Rosenfeld, quote, emerged as perhaps the most important and likable figure in the history of peanut butter. He is credited with putting in place staple elements of the product that we know and love today. For example, crunchy peanut butter was his idea. Rosefield, thank you for crunchy peanut butter. I prefer the smooth. I won't turn down the crunchy. I mean, you know, it's peanut butter. One time, this is a tangent of mine. One time I took the biggest plastic jar of peanut, smooth, creamy peanut butter I could find. I read this in a hunting magazine somewhere. And I went out to a deer stand I liked. And you take the cap off the peanut butter and you screw it into a tree about three feet up, maybe a little taller, three to four feet up. And then you screw the uh, peanut butter container onto the lid that's screwed to the tree. And then you cut out a circle in the bottom end of the peanut butter jar. But it's a pla it has to be plastic. And what you have created is a peanut butter source for deer in the woods. If you put it up high enough, usually other smaller ground vermin won't get to it and mess with it. Now I found it pulled off the tree several times and rolled away from that tree several times, probably raccoons, could be deer eating it as it moved. You know, they would move it while trying to lick the peanut butter out of it. I shot three deer out of that stand that season, that early season when I had that peanut butter up. So I'm going to say it works. Corn feeders work real good too, but this was just an interesting experiment that I did. I don't think I have any other interesting experiments I've done with peanut butter. Certainly not with dogs, you perverts. Um... I did one time a long time ago, my first year of college, stick my penis in a jar of jelly. I think I was drunk. No one was there. I really shouldn't tell this story. But if you've listened to my show, I've said way worse and probably done way worse. And it's funny. Who cares? I don't care. Um... Back to the family friendly, friendly part of the show here. Uh, once peanut butter was more available, dropping down from the upper classes to the middle classes and the lower class, it actually became a minor lift to the spirits of struggling Americans. It was very, very popular. During the Depression... Many families survived on peanut butter, making peanut butter or trading for peanut butter or buying peanut butter. 
they would just make the sandwiches. It was cheap. It was easy. Kids would eat it. Everyone would eat it. If you're hungry, you'd eat it, right? Uh, they're talking peanut butter sandwiches. They may not have had jelly. Maybe that's why all these other things were put on it with peanut butter. But the peanut butter was number one, lead roll, alpha dog to the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So meanwhile, while all this peanut butter creation is going on, jelly was hanging around. It was just preserves made by uh, ingenious moms and grandmothers in kitchens, making their own jelly and jams, fruit preserves. And in 1917, Reader, Reader's Digest wrote of a man named Paul Welch, who was the son of the Welch's grape juice creator. So grape juice was out there. Well, Paul Welch, the son of, it doesn't give his dad's name besides Welch, grape juice creator. Paul introduced grape Grape, grape L-A-D-E, Grape-A-Lade. That sounds like it'd be someone's name on a bus in the country. And it was a jelly made from pure reed Concord grapes. Grape jelly was the first big hit. And that's kind of what lots of kids like. I'm a strawberry guy, but I like it too. I like jelly too. Um, so Rosefield was making peanut butter huge in the United States. And Welch came along with his jelly that he called grape -Aid, which is bizarre. Never heard that before, right? So... When would they come together, it says, although I think we already talked about that. Um, it said here, oh, here's a jar of Welch's grape -Aid, pure grape jam, I think it says. I can't read it because it's small. Um, an outside force made peanut butter and jelly or PB&J, widespread across the continent. It was the armed forces during World War II. Another creation made large by World War II. What was the last one I talked about? I was just talking about one. I tell this story all the time, and I'll never think of it. It was baseball. No, that was the Civil War. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Americans needed quick and easy food during the war effort, during the war push. And it was decided that, well, obviously, the soldiers needed an energy-giving diet. That's why they were given Hershey's chocolate all the time. Hitler and the Germans were given methamphetamines to do their, uh, their uh, offense, offense, their battles, their blitzkriegs. That's what they're called, blitzkriegs, lightning strikes. They were all hopped up on methamphetamines. Whereas uh, G.I. Joe was given peanut butter and uh, chocolate bars. Isn't that wild? And then after the war, it became a mainstay that moms would make for their kids. It was easy. You pulled it out of a jar with a knife or spoon. You spread it on sliced bread. You pushed it together. You put it on the counter. Sometimes you cut the crust off. Sometimes you cut it in a, in a, in a triangle or just in a rectangle. Or sometimes you ate them whole, which is how I do it. And, uh, God, who doesn't love one? I mean, I, I want a peanut butter and banana sandwich, but I don't have any dang bananas right now. My daughter, who is staying with my mom tonight, they're best friends. I love it. She loves the peanut butter and honey, which is very good. Uh, if I have any of these and I don't have milk, really, really cold vitamin D red cap milk, Gosh, it's almost not worth eating. I'd eat it if I was hungry, obviously. But as, as just pure joy, 
I gotta have the milk. I'll just chug it out of the out of the jug, out of the gallon. I, my kids watch me do it, so they're gonna do it. I imagine my, my daughter won't. But um, no, actually, my son uses cups too. They're really good kids. I'm the bad influence. Anyway, the lunchbox standby has been referenced widely in popular culture on television. Oh, uh, this is where a son failed, did something. I'm not going to go into that. I don't care about that. Um, and it was in Breaking Bad. I don't care about that. Down here, we're talking with individuals existed on the nuttier end of the spectrum. But PB&J is truly a snack for all. Studies show certain types of people like different varieties of peanut butter. Duh. Smooth peanut butter eaters self-reported as being more introverted. Crunchy peanut butter eaters tend to be more extroverted. When I was young, I liked the crunchy. And I was very extroverted. I'm still extroverted, but I like the smooth. All right, that's that. Uh, that's from the vintagenews.com which I found and made, gave me this idea while rolling through Facebook. And, you know, there's so many uh, ads now scrolling down through your uh, homepage, or not your homepage, the uh, other page. Let's see if there's something different. What, what kind of song am I going to roll out after this? What kind of outro that has to do with peanut butter and jelly? Ooh, peanut butter and jelly time. What am I? I I can't believe I just gave it away. I'm gonna have to find something else. Um, okay, we did the preparation. We're back at Wikipedia, guys and gals. We did the variations, guys and gals. We did the dang. We did it all. Hmm. A little nutrition before we uh, close the boat. A peanut butter and jelly sandwich that is made with two slices of white bread. Racist. Two tablespoons each of peanut butter and grape jelly provide 403 calories, 18 grams of fat, 58 grams of carbohydrates, which is mostly sugar, 12 grams of protein, mostly from peanut butter, which is a 27% RDI of fat and 22% of calories. You need calories for energy. You need fat, people whether you know it or not, to break down most of your vitamin intake. You can eat all the vitamins you want. You can take all the vitamin C ester you want, vitamin D, vitamin E, your B complexes. But if you don't have certain nutritional fats in there digesting with them, they won't break down. And you'll either pee it right back out and you don't want it then, or you'll do the other, which we won't get into. Because who wants to step into that? While roughly 50% of the calories are from fat, most are monounsaturated fat and polyunsaturated fats, which are said by the American Heart Association to be beneficial to heart health. So... Who all wants a peanut butter and anything sandwich, right? Down here, you know how it says see also at the bottom of Wikipedia? I'm just doing filler now. And then maybe I'll change it out one more time. Uh, they have a peanut butter, banana, and bacon sandwich. That sounds really interesting because I like bacon. It's got, it can't be too limp, but it can't be. It just can't be super crispy either, where it just crumbles away. Where's the fun in that? You just end up getting it in your throat. Holy cow! This looks like a loaf of French bread that's hollowed out in the center, and it's filled with creamy peanut butter and grape jelly and a pound of bacon. So it's one jar of creamy peanut butter, one jar of grape jelly, and a pound of cooked bacon in the middle of a loaf of bread. And this is a baked loaf you get, like an Italian loaf, or you'll see a, uh, 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 uh
it got the French French bread, but it looks like an Italian loaf, but I don't know what kind of bread it is because it's a picture, but it's called Fool's Gold Loaf, <laughs> and it looks really good. The, the peanut butter's on the bottom, the bacon's over the peanut butter, the jelly's on top, and then it's sandwiched together, Lord Sandwich. There's a silly picture over here with some kind of home bread, homemade, homemade bread it looks like. Peanut butter and strawberry jam create a red-orange contrast. Thank you very much. Um, the PB&J is considered by Wikipedia as a lunch, dinner, or snack. You can eat it as breakfast. Just, you know, don't tell anybody I said you could. But you can. I promise. You can do it. It's okay. And then we have a list of sandwiches and a list of peanut dishes. We are not going to go there either. So we are done diddly done on the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. If this was a uh, live show and I had a phone line and people were listening, you could call in and tell me a peanut butter and jelly story. Uh, my email is harrymday at usa.com if you want to write me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich story that's strange, odd, bizarre, unique, funny, deadly, uh, whatever. Um, I don't expect any emails. But that's okay, too. That's kind of how I, I roll through life. I really don't expect much, and what does come my way, I'm appreciative for, and I enjoy it to the fullest. Gosh, that sounded weird. Yeah. The fluffer nutter. I'm, I've got to look up the fluffer nutter here. Oh, it just gives me a picture. No, it takes me to it. The fluffer nutter was invented in Massachusetts during World War I. Peanut butter and marshmallow cream sandwich. The term fluffer nutter, though, was created by an ad agency in 1960. But the actual sandwich was uh, made during World War I. That's interesting. Marshmallow cream. So I've got a, a secret to tell. All 10 of you, maybe 12 of you. I've had more listens per uh, episode lately, but they, you know, they're out there on Spotify and iTunes and Google and all the other platforms. And you never know when someone's going to come across one. And since it's out there, it's always out there. And so I'm just the listens just keep going up. I'm over 4,200 listens, I think. If not, I'm just short of it. Um... <laughs> the fluffer nutter was criticized later in its lifespan, meaning 2006, I think, where Massachusetts State Senator Jarrett Barrios, probably a Democrat, see, Boston and Massachusetts was the seat of liberty, of freedom, of let me do what I want to do if I'm not hurting you. And now there is liberal and uh, not registered, uh, uh, relegated, there's another word, taxed for sure, than most places other than California and New York. And they're driving people and businesses out of their states. But I don't want to get any more political than that. This senator gained national attention when he proposed legislation restricting the serving of the fluffer nutter in public schools. The senator learned that his son was served fluffer nutters on a daily basis in Cambridge at a public elementary school. And so he had created an amendment to a junk food bill that aimed to limit the serving of fluffer nutters in Massachusetts public schools to only once a week. See, that's exactly what these liberals do. 
However, the proposal was criticized as an example of trivial and overly intrusive legislation here, here. Though Barrio supporters pointed concerns over the problem of childhood obesity. Well, hey, how about you be a parent? Huh? How about you be a parent? And if they eat too many, you punish them. You take away things they like. Because you already know their face is in a phone all the time. Or a game system. You shut her down. They'll eat less of those things. Won't you make them go play? I make mine go play. Well, some of them I don't. Sometimes I don't have to make them. They're just they're well balanced. I'm lucky. I'm blessed. Thank you very much. The fluffer nutter. Um. There was a senator who planned to fight. Quote, fight to the death for fluff. And wanted to make the fluffer nutter the official state sandwich. See, this is exactly trivial legislative movements. And that's what they do. They make movements. They make big BMs. And we ain't happy with that. So we gotta vo- we got to vote all the incumbents out. I got political again. I apologize for that. I will uh, close this out because, gosh, it just keeps going on about the Fluffernutter. There's almost more on here about the Fluffernutter than there is about the peanut butter and jelly sandwich, which is an icon. Huh. I'm going to have to close it out, so I'll just stop reading it, and I can close this out. Anyway, it's the same message that I always have. I want you to stay in touch with your family and your relatives, pick a relative a week and reach out and say, hi, how you doing, what you been doing? Family's very important, they're blood. And you need to keep up with them. Let them know how you're doing. Reach out to them if you need help. And they might reach out to you and they need help. That's what they're for. We're to help each other. And then we have all our friends, right? And I don't mean Facebook friends. I mean friends that we talk to, friends that we see and interact with. I I don't want to leave out old friends that we don't see anymore, but we can stay in touch with them on Facebook and message them and email them if you do that, but the instant messages are easier. Or just going on their uh, Facebook page. That's why I love Facebook. I have so many friends in my past lives that I like to stay in touch with and see what they're up to. That's just who I is. So let your friends know that you're out there and you're thinking about them and you wonder how they're doing and you want to find out. And you can like keep these friendships stoked. They're important. And it keeps you a little more sane. Keeps you a little more grounded. And that's a great thing. And then we have everyone else on the planet. Some call them strangers, some call them humans, some call them earthlings. Uh, The way I look at it is you start in the community. When you're at the grocery store, when you're at the post office, when you're at a gas station, when you're at a football game at school, which we've started back up. And talk to people. I'm in the South. When I was not in the South... When I, I've probably told this story 50 times on this show. When I was in California and I'd go to Ralph's, the grocery store, and I'm waiting in line to pay because you didn't have auto pay in 2002, or not auto pay, but like self-scan, self-checkout. The way I, I did Ralph's was I'd be out surfing after I did my part-time job stuff. I had two part-time jobs, doing clerical work of all things, and then I'd go surfing, And then I'd come back into, where was I? San Clemente. I'd go into Ralph's. I'd go straight to the the cabinet, the glass enclosure cabinet of uh, donuts made that morning. It was all just like singles. And I'd grab one that I liked. I'd shove the whole thing in my mouth and eat it as I shopped for whatever little things I needed. 
I did that up until this lady followed me to the donut cabinet. <laughs> And I saw her follow me, and so I didn't do anything. And she, she, she said, I've got my eye on you. I'm like, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, thank you. And I just continued walking. And I didn't steal any more donuts at that grocery store. I think I did at the other, though. But it was just one day-old donut, or almost half a day-old donut. And I did buy stuff, so. Holy cow, what was I talking about? <laughs> yes, strangers, be kind. You couldn't talk to anyone there in line on the West Coast. If you did, they looked at you like you were insane. They'd turn their back on you. They'd give you the wide eye and like be looking over their shoulder at you as they walked to their car thinking you were probably going to carjack them, take them home, nail them to their floor, and then ransack the place and kill them. Not that I've ever done anything like that. Gosh, this show is turning out way better than it started. Um... But in Mississippi, you can talk to anybody and they will talk with you. You can do it in the South mostly. But this is my home. And when you talk to these people whom you maybe recognize, have seen or talked to before, or you're talking to them for the very first time, even if it's just thank you, yes ma'am, no ma'am, how's your day, good day, kind words and a smile will make these people realize they're nice people out there. Some of these people don't think there are. Some of these people hate people. We don't know who they are usually, but you can lighten up their life for five minutes and maybe they have some hope. It's just, it's something I call it spreading the ripple of kindness. You know, you, you throw a rock in the water and the ripple goes out. Let's say that ripple is kindness of you being kind to somebody. And they feel that kindness. And so then they go turn around and they're kind to somebody and it hit, that ripple ripples out. So you got multiple ripples of kindness busting out and your community is getting happier. That's the goal at least. That's the theory. I'll never know the results, but I'm going to plug at it and just uh, enjoy, you know. And other than that, all I can say is thank you for listening you in Ireland, because I know you're there listening. You down near Hattiesburg, because I know you're listening. Uh, I had a listener, a regular listener in Australia. I do not know if you still listen or not. There's several around Mississippi because, like, I'll get a comment from someone about a show or something. It just blows me away because I just do this for fun. I don't make any money doing this. I don't want to make money doing it. Well, it'd be awesome if I made money doing this, but it's not my goal. Now I can say the way I close it out every time. Peace. Yes.